the problems that Facebook creates are fixable, and I'm extremely interested in those solutions. I don't just dismiss Facebook as you know some evil tobacco company, you know, poisoning our minds. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today, how big tech is reshaping the global order. At a time when companies like Facebook and Google have never been more influential, they're also facing increased government scrutiny. In a piece I just wrote for Foreign Affairs magazine, I discuss why some of the biggest tech companies in the world are essentially becoming digital nation states. They generate more revenue than the GDPs of most countries, and their diplomatic priorities are, of course, very different than the governments that are supposed to regulate them. There's a lot to unpack here, and I've got just the guy to do it. Nick Thompson, he's CEO of The Atlantic and former Wired Editor-in-Chief. Don't worry, I've also got your puppet regime. Sorry, 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 not sorry, not sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, not sorry, not sorry, sorry. But first. On Monday, October 4th, Facebook and its companion services, Instagram and WhatsApp, disappeared from the internet for more than five hours. Hundreds of millions of people around the world using some of the most popular social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, have been forced offline in a major global blackout. During this time, roughly 3.5 billion users had to seek alternative ways to communicate with friends and family, to advertise to consumers, and perhaps most problematically, to be influenced by influencers. Facebook blamed the blackout on a botched maintenance attempt. And while a Google or Microsoft outage would have been more catastrophic, this blackout showed just how dependent the world has become on a company that is already under the gun. Critics and conspiracy theorists were quick to point out the suspicious timing of the blackout, which occurred just one day after a Facebook whistleblower revealed herself in a bombshell 60 Minutes interview. But the broader point, never has a small group of companies held such an expansive influence over humanity. And in this new digital territory, governments have little idea what to do. It's a reality that Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison grappled with earlier this year, when Google threatened to stop making its search tool available down under in response to increased regulation. You know, you can't have these platforms with a business model which is about being in the Wild West forever. The sheriff turns up eventually. Will the sheriff turn up this time? Whether it's Australia or the United States, or the EU or China, no government today has the toolbox to tinker with big tech, which is why I think it's time to start thinking of the biggest tech companies as bona fide digital nation states. No, I'm not saying you'll be pledging allegiance to the United States of Apple anytime soon, but they're writing our social contract 2.0, whether or not we know it. Wait, 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 you say. There have been powerful companies before. Does anyone remember the East India Company? What about Big Oil? In its heyday, Exxon was a more important partner for many foreign countries than the US government. But all of these companies operated in physical space, meat space, as we like to say, where governments with guns ultimately hold sway. Big tech is different. It's creating an entirely new dimension of geopolitics in digital space, where the rules, at least as far as we can see and experience, are very different. And that's because big tech companies aren't just competing with governments to regulate how information moves around or whose accounts get banned for, I don't know, fomenting a coup against Congress. They're also designing the substance of digital space itself, right down to individual lines of code. And there's more. Big tech companies are increasingly providing basic security, and cybersecurity, and essential real world goods and services. This influence will only grow as more of our daily lives, work, and the infrastructure that powers entirely cities and economies comes to rely on digital connectivity. Today, I'm discussing all that and more with a man who has grappled with the thorniest tech issues of our time and lived to tell the tale. Nick Thompson, CEO of The Atlantic and former Wired Editor-in-Chief joins the show. Here's our conversation. Nick, we've known each other a long time. What's the thing that has changed your life the most in terms of technology? The way technology has changed media is 
kind of interesting in that the work actually hasn't really shifted that much, right? The kinds of stories that I edited when I was 24 years old versus 44 years old are not different really in any way. I hope they're better because I'm better at it, but it's more or less the exact same stories of the same length. But the distribution has turned upside down, right? The way we read them, right? And we read them all on phones, we read them, you know, get the key ideas parsed out on Twitter. Like the way that they're distributed and consumed has completely changed. Now, when I think about Wired and when Wired, when Wired first came into my consciousness, I thought about a magazine that was about people that geeked out on gadgets. It was tech boosterism. That is not what Wired was when you were at the helm. How do you think we think about technology now, both through your role there and more broadly? Yeah, you know, the story of Wired is a pretty good story, I think, in some ways, about the way the role of technology in American life. And it was a magazine about optimism, right? And it was the notion change is good, right? We had that was one of our slogans early on. And that was a good marketing slogan. It was believed by the early founders of Wired. But by the time I took the helm of Wired, I became the editor in chief in 2017. You know, right after I started, you know, right my last day at the New Yorker, two days before I started at Wired, was the inauguration of Donald Trump. It was pretty hard to argue that change is good at that point. Um, and so I would joke that, you know, the slogan of my predecessor was, Wired is where the future is realized. And under me, it was going to be Wired is where the future is realized and the present is fixed. One of the covers that was most famous, certainly got the most notoriety um, under your tenure, was showing Mark Zuckerberg beaten and bruised. Um, and yet, if you did that cover today, you probably would have added a, f a few more marks to his face. What kind of a corporate citizen is Facebook and is Mark today, in your view? So that was in 20. Uh, 18. Um, and I, you know, it was a story about you know, what had happened to Facebook, you know, basically following the election in 16 through the following year. And it was a story about a company that was trying to figure out its role in society, it was a company struggling to understand itself. And, you know, the sort of the arc of the story described the way that Facebook, in a desperate attempt to, um, appease or keep Republicans at bay, willfully blinded itself to what was happening on the platform during the election. So at the end of that story, there's a long section about the algorithm changes that Facebook was making. And um, they were doing something called meaningful social interactions. And the idea then was they were going to change the core algorithm of the newsfeed to prioritize reactions among family and friends. And the idea was to make Facebook better, to solve like this would be a way to solve some of the fake news problems, some of the Russian misinformation problems, some of the sort of the hostility problems. Those algorithmic changes, the things that made up the last section of the piece, we finally know what their effect is because of the documents released by the whistleblower. And it turns out that those algorithmic changes were totally baleful. They actually didn't do anything good. What happened was by prioritizing comments and engagement across friends and family, it seemed to fill Facebook with actually more posts where people were just screaming at each other and like posts where people would um, say toxic things, you know, did very well under those algorithmic changes. And, and, and to be fair, there's nothing the whistleblower said directly that would lead you in any other direction than that, right? Yeah, I mean, the whistleblower actually, you know, in a way has a view of Facebook somewhat similar to mine in that. Yeah. You know, as she said, you know, Frances Hogan goes on in the testimony and she says, look, I don't want to destroy Facebook. I want to fix Facebook. Right. And my view is the same. The problems that Facebook creates are fixable. And I'm extremely interested in those solutions. I don't just dismiss Facebook as, you know, some evil tobacco company, you know, poisoning our minds. As we think about not just Facebook, but all of these very, very large and powerful technology companies, most of which are in the United States and China is, is first that they operate in this digital world that they create. And as a consequence, they exercise a level of sovereignty um, that, that makes it very hard um, both to understand what is driving their business and to think about how one might go about regulating it. How do you think about Th this new type of virtual or digital power that is exerted 
by these corporations? I mean, I think it's something we've never grappled with. And I actually think it's now some point in the last like couple years, it's gotten even crazier because, you know, back when I was reporting on that first Facebook story, the way the Facebook algorithm worked is there were a bunch of inputs and a bunch of levers, right? And you can imagine somebody in the control room and they're like, you weight likes by 5% or you weight them by four and you weight reshares by 3%, right? And you have a bunch of outcomes you're looking for. And now it's just an AI system optimized for whatever it's optimized for, right? The, the most interesting question at Facebook is like, does anybody know exactly what this algorithm is optimized for? Let's then go from there to the tech companies themselves. So, uh, you know, tech companies start out and it's don't be evil and it's I want to make the place a better planet. I mean, the reality is that these tech companies have very different models. And I'm, I'm wondering which models you think are likely to be most successful? Do you see them becoming more national champions with the US or with democracies, with China? Or is it gonna be um, a very different model where digital space just becomes something completely other and separate from governments that don't work very well? What do you think about that? If you look at the US companies, they're quite different models for how they've dealt with those challenges. To some degree, they've all pursued the same, right? They all have you know, drifted away from the idealism. They all have hired lots of lobbyists. They all have started working with the government to some degree. They all are oppositional to the government to other degrees. But I actually think if you look more carefully and you put the big companies under you know, more of a magnifying glass, um, Google has probably worked harder to maintain its culture and the you know, sense of like creative geniuses still taking Fridays off and you know, some of the don't be evil aesthetics. And I think that Google has probably worked harder to maintain their culture. I think Microsoft has probably, you know, worked most successfully to sort of become a partner of the United States government and, a, you know, a company that is, you know, seen as a champion for freedom and democracy and, you know, all the work they do against hackers. Facebook has, I think, obviously been the company that has struggled the most um, where it sort of earned the admonition of, you know, everybody across government, where a lot of the internal culture has, um, has become frayed. Um, obviously, it needs to, you know, repair bo on both of those issues. So right now, they're sort of subservient to the state. My guess is that over time, the large tech companies, whether it's in the United States, or China's a whole different matter. So let's just talk about the U.S., just gradually become more and more powerful um, and the state becomes less and less powerful relative to them. China has a robust private sector that is the largest part of their economy. It's certainly the most productive part. And in the digital space, um, it has played a very strong role that now the Chinese government is increasingly uneasy with trying to rein in in lots of ways. Well, you know, it's so interesting because up until, I don't know, six months ago, I would have said the model in China is completely different, right? They're state champions, you know, they're, you know, working with the large tech companies to help advantage them, you know, over the American tech companies. It's, uh, and then, you know, Jack Ma disappears and it's like, wait, wait, what's, what's going on? There's been, you know, a massive shift that I did not anticipate in the way that the CCP views its tech sector. Um, and you know, one of the interesting questions will be what is the, like, there is a chance it ultimately makes the Chinese tech sector, right, more efficient, right? If you have, like, less government championing of particular winners, maybe you have more competition, right? This, uh, there are a number of people who've written about China who actually feel like this could be a useful move to increase the relative power of Chinese tech because you won't have large inefficient companies that are beholden to the government and the government is beholden to. Um, my guess, though, is that, I mean, there's been a, what, a trillion dollars in market cap valuation wiped away over the last few months in China because of the moves of the government. Um, you know, in an interesting way, the executives at Microsoft and Amazon, Google and Facebook must be thinking, hmm, well, maybe if the Chinese government isn't backing them all, maybe there's, you know, maybe we can win, you know, win in more markets. So, Nick, LinkedIn has just said that they are shuttering their social media operations in the People's Republic uh, because of complications of being able to operate there. And a number of journalists have been deplatformed recently as questions around why. Um, do, do you how, tell me how you, you think about uh, these companies, the interoperability um, of, of this 
of these interactions of, of human beings that should be connected <laughs> between our two countries. Yeah, so I am, I have a minority view among my peers that like operating in China is a huge social good for the world. And I think, you know, I wish Google did more in China. I wish Facebook, you know, Facebook obviously wants to be in China, can't remotely be in China. Like I'm glad Apple sells a lot of phones in China. Um, the question is operating in China requires you at a certain point to weigh those benefits against holding your principles. And so I don't know, and obviously there's a line that you can't cross. And it sounds like what happened at LinkedIn is they probably, they probably went in with something like a philosophy like mine of this is good for the world net net to connect people. Like I certainly want people in China to be able to see, you know, the things I put on LinkedIn. I think it's good for them to see it. I think it's good for me to see reciprocal things in China. It's good for me to connect with people in China. It makes the world better. Um, but, you know, if indeed LinkedIn has been, you know, the Chinese government has said you have to deplatform these people, you have to delete these posts, at some point you cross a line you can't justify. If you were the CEO of one of these enormous technology companies, what is the one no regrets move that you would really like to make that you think would make a positive difference? I would overhaul the way the core algorithm works at either YouTube or Facebook. Um, and I would optimize it not for engagement or money, but I would optimize it for whatever the most sophisticated metric I could come up with for, you know, deep human satisfaction. And so I would change the, I would change the way, the fundamental nature of the way the core product works. And I'm convinced that would be the right thing to do. Good to be with you, my friend. Thanks for having me on. And now to Puppet Regime where Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has some apologizing to do. Sorry, 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 not sorry, not sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, not sorry, not sorry, sorry. Oh, hey, it's me, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Your Life. Now, various actual humans have told me lately that I have a bit of a PR problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and apologize again. Let's see how it goes this time. Let's start with the outage on October 4th. To all the businesses who were affected, I am truly, truly sorry that you're so dependent on me to reach your customers. God, can't you guys sell stuff on your own? What? That's not an apology? God, God, human emotions are so weird. Okay, let's try another one. To Congress, I'm so sorry that after all these hearings and investigations, you guys still don't like understand how the internet actually works. Are we done? There's apologies for the rest of the world too? God. To Europe, I'd just like to say, I'm so, so sorry that you don't have any big tech companies of your own. Grow some before you tell me what to do with mine, geez. And to Xi Jinping, look, I am sorry, but you are not gonna be the only person using technology to control a billion people out here. You are not. Cause in the end, we are a global superpower, super chill company that prides itself on bringing people together. That's our show this week. Come back next week, and if you like what you see, you prefer meat space to digital space, I know I do, why don't you take a minute to sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal. <laughs>